welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and to overcome disordered eating. I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist, and I'm really excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information, and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today I have another guest on the show and I'm speaking to Amy Harmon who is all the way from Fairfax, Virginia in the US. So Amy is a licensed marriage and family therapist and certified eating disorder specialist. She sees individuals, couples and families who are themselves struggling with an eating disorder or who have loved ones they are supporting. So I'm really excited to be speaking to Amy today to kind of hear more about all that valuable work that she does. And Amy has also recently written a book all about body image. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing more about this journey to writing this book and also for Amy to share some of her kind of valuable insights and understanding all about body image. So let's get over to the interview. I hope you enjoy. Hi, Amy. I'm great to have you on the podcast today. Hi, thanks for having me. Okay, Amy, can you tell us a bit more about who you are and what you do? I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm also a certified eating disorder specialist. So I treat people in therapy. I see individuals, couples, and families. And most of my clients are those who are struggling with eating disorders. Okay. And how are you doing now with the kind of lockdown and everything where you are? What stage are you at? So our opening is going state by state here and I'm in Virginia and we're like on the more timid side in, in the United States. There are a lot of states who are opening a lot quicker than we are. So most of us are still working from home. I'm working from home. My husband's working from home. Our kids are doing virtual school masks are required, you know, inside. So we're doing okay, but it's getting a little, it's getting a little tiring. The quarantine is a little tiring. (laughs) Yeah, no, it is, isn't it? So, and are, so are your children as well, will they be like doing schools online sort of right into September as well? Is that kind of how it's working? Yeah. So they even delayed the school start So my kids aren't starting school until September 8th and they'll all three have their own laptop that the school has issued them and they'll be doing it all online. Right. Okay. Sure. Okay. Because I mean, I think we're similar to you in in a lot of respects. Like I'm still doing all my work online and my husband's doing a bit Mm -hmm. now going into the office, but the children are actually all going back to school after six months or five months. Oh, wow. However long it's been. (laughs) So yeah, that's quite a big deal. Actually, they're kind of going back on the eighth and they're not looking forward to it. (laughs) They quite enjoyed the working from home, I think. Um, (laughs) But I'd be quite pleased with them to Do they have to wear masks at school? No, they're not going to have to wear masks at school, but they've got loads of different things in place, like with social distancing and yeah, one-way systems. And I mean, goodness knows how it's going to all work out. So yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting. (laughs) (laughs) The great experiment. Great experiment, definitely. (laughs) So Amy, can you tell us a bit more as well about your journey in becoming a therapist? Yeah, I wish I had like a more exciting story to share. I know a lot of therapists maybe have their own history with therapy, but that just wasn't how it was for me. I decided to major in psychology when I went to college because I really loved my psychology class that I took in high school. And so I just kept going forward with that. But I I was kind of on the traditional side of thinking and I just thought, oh, I'm, I'm really not going to have a career. I plan on being a mom and I'm not really going to work that much. And so I thought I would be a high school teacher. So I majored in psychology, minored in English so that I could teach English in school. But then as I got going and I was still single, I'm like, you know what? I really like what I'm doing. I'd really like to work with people. Like I want to counsel people. And so that kind of prompted me to go on to get a master's degree in marriage and family therapy. And I'm just so happy that, that that's what I chose to do because I love my job and I'm very happy (laughs) like working. I actually enjoy working even though 
earlier in my life, I didn't think I would enjoy it so much. Mm. Well, I'm so glad that you did pursue that path, actually, because it's, it sounds like in a way, yeah, like once you kind of got hooked and once you got a kind of taste and interest, you were kind of on a path then, weren't you? And you right. wanted to do more. Yeah, mm. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us as well a bit more about the way you work with your clients? Yeah. So because I went to school in marriage and family therapy, we are really systems oriented. And what that means is that we really look at people's relationships and their family relationships and how those affect their healing. And so I really love bringing in my client's parents or my client's spouse or other people who are in their system to kind of help them through that process. And so I'm always looking at boundaries and and relationships. And my very, very favorite thing is working with teens and their parents. I don't know why, but it's just so delightful for me. (laughs) Mm, Sure. I think it's it's fantastic, actually, that you're, you know, that you are bringing the support system in. Because I think it is, it's really quite hard, isn't it, to treat, I think, someone with an eating disorder or any mental health condition, really, in isolation, the support system is so crucial and like is that as well true because I think you know in the UK and I'm just speaking from the experience in the service I work in the family work generally tends to be much more for like teens I guess or younger people and then once people become adults you know it's not that the family are not involved but it's it's much less like a kind of standard part of treatment but is that is that kind of different for you like would you be kind of working with the whole system like regardless of the age of the person in therapy? That's a good question. It is more the teens and the young adults. I still do a lot of work with parents, but even my older clients, like sometimes I'll have, you know, like I'll have a 40 year old woman in my office and I'll bring her mom in, you know, and talk Mm. to her, her mom about things or like sometimes a young mother. And it's, it's not always, an ongoing thing, but I just do like bringing them in for maybe one or two sessions to help them understand where this person is in their recovery and what they need from their loved one that will help them on that journey. Yeah, no, sure. And I think it's just so valuable, isn't it? I think because of, you know, for for many people as well, I guess it's for the longer term, they're going to be back in that system, aren't they? And once the therapy ends, the more support they've got around them, the more people that really kind of have more of a psychological understanding of the problem. It's just going to be so helpful. Yes. Yes, exactly. So what are your sort of particular interests and passions in therapy? So since I've been working in the eating disorder field, I have found that I really love body image work. I see it not only, you know, in my clients, but I see it in the people around me. I feel like body image is just such a huge issue for so many people, you know, men and women and children and older adults, you know, it really spans the spans the globe, I would say. And so I've just really been drawn to that. And I see how big of an issue it is for those with eating disorders as well. So it fits nicely with that. Mm, sure no I mean it's such a a massive issue isn't it body image and do you think as well like do you think kind of with working with people like across all ages you know do you think as well like our relationship with our body does kind of change as we kind of mature and get older and like are there any sort of particular trends or things that you notice yeah that's a really good question and I would say you know just as our relationships with other people change and develop over time, our relationship with our body is the same way. And so, you know, if our relationship with our body is off on the wrong foot, and we've never really liked our body, it's going to kind of tend to stay that way until we actively do something to change that. Mm -hmm. I have seen people in my office, though, who kind of on their own terms, like women, like as they've grown older, maybe had body image issues in their teens and in their twenties. And then as they got older and had children, they finally decided, you know what, I'm done. I'm done fighting with my body. I'm ready to just accept that and move on. And so sometimes I will see, you know, that relationship kind of spontaneously change, I guess, if you will, but usually it requires a little bit more effort and, and work. Mm, sure I think it's just such a helpful point actually isn't it because I think 
it does take work, doesn't it, to change your relationship with your body. And it's, yeah, if we're kind of quite passive about that and we're just kind of waiting for something external to happen, it might never mm-hmm. happen. And it's, yeah, like all these things, like any relationship, it's one that we have to kind of really invest in. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So you've recently written a book. <laughs> I'm so <Yay>. excited for <laughs> you. <laughs> so like, tell us about your book. Yeah, it was just, you know, such an amazing opportunity for me to write this book. I had wanted to write a book and I was thinking about writing all these different things on body image and I had already written some things and, you know, never really published it and just, it was kind of set aside. And then when this publisher approached me with this opportunity, I was like, absolutely. Like there's no other person that could write this book for you. Like it was like this perfect match. And so... I'm really excited to get the word out to everybody so that they can have a more peaceful relationship with their bodies and also that they can be aware of like the negative messages that are in our culture and they can kind of fight back against those messages. Mm, Sure. No, brilliant. I think it's a much needed book. And can I just ask you a question actually about the whole kind of cultural thing as well? Sure. Obviously, there's so much kind of pressure, isn't there, with like social media and television and diets Mm. and all these kind of messages that we get. But, you know, I think sometimes I feel a bit overwhelmed as a therapist about kind of like where Mm. to start with it all. Because, you know, you kind (laughs) of like try and impart these kind of helpful messages to clients and, and help them to try and have some boundaries and protect themselves a bit from diet culture. But it's sometimes it just feels like overwhelming. And I just, I guess I just wondered, like, What are your thoughts on that in terms of like, almost if you could get a magic wand and like, you know, change Mm. like a couple of things, what do you think could be most powerful, do you think, in terms of influencing the culture? Mm. Yeah, if I could get my magic wand out and change the culture, this is a great question, Harriet. (laughs) I would, I would change. No (laughs) pressure. I definitely would change the idea that your body has to be a certain size. If we could let go of that one thing, then I think that would solve our problems with diet culture. I think it would solve our problems with fat phobia. I think it would help us not compare as much. I mean, I think it's hard to stop comparing totally, but I really think it would solve a lot of problems with comparison and feeling like you have to be a certain way, but just being accepting of all sizes really would be an amazing feat for our culture. Mm, sure. Yeah. And no, I'm completely with you with that. I think, I think that one thing, which sounds so simple, but is quite a long way off at the moment, it just turns everything on its head, doesn't it? Massively, I think. Right. Yeah, definitely. So tell me a bit more about the book. Like, has it been a goal that you've sort of pursued for a while, like in terms of wanting to write this book? Yeah, it has been a goal of mine, mostly on the back burner. But when I had my third son, my third child, and last so far, (laughs) probably, (laughs) (laughs) I just felt like, you know, here I am at home. I wasn't working a ton of hours. And I'm like, I just am still drawn to my passion of body image. And I really wanted to do something with my time that was in my career. And so I started writing a book about five years ago. And like I said, it just was never published. And it kind of was just sitting there for the last couple of years. And so when I got this opportunity to write this book again, I'm like, I knew exactly what I wanted to write. And it's actually Mm. quite different than the book I had written, you know, five years ago. And it's better, you know, I think my thoughts are more succinct and a little bit better put and better thought out than it would have been five years ago. Yeah, no, sure. Yeah, and I guess it's probably often the way, isn't it, with writing that it kind of like your initial ideas often you don't even realize that they kind of need a bit of development maybe, you know, Mm -hmm. before they're kind of ready to kind of be, yeah, what you actually want to say. I'm just aware, actually, I'm sitting in the conservatory and it's just starting to rain. So (laughs) if you can hear that on the podcast, it's just a little shower in the UK at the moment. (laughs) I actually don't hear it on my end, so hopefully you're not it's okay. okay. <laughs> it's really tricky actually because I, I don't want to move out of the room because then I'm probably going to like 
hear like children fighting or something <laughs> so we're just gonna go it. with the rain <laughs> so what was your schedule as well for like for doing your writing and fitting that into your life like how did you did you like kind of get into a sort of yeah a schedule that made it work yeah my publisher had some strict deadlines well I guess I don't know if strict is the right word but I I'm someone who sees a deadline and it is strict and so I will finish it on a deadline and so I I knew that I would have to take you know a few hours you know several days a week and just spend that time at the computer writing my book and I think that those those deadlines really helped and and because my publisher is not like a traditional publisher like they had an idea of where this where this book was going to go and and kind of an outline it was a bit fast paced. So I started writing the book in February of this year. And then the book was published in August. Mm. So it happened like just super, super fast. There's not like, you know, time to really sit around and wonder and and think about things like it. it, It's kind of like pumped out really quickly. Sure. And how did you find the whole like process of writing the book? Like, was it like an enjoyable experience? Like, did you kind of get really into it? Yeah, it took me a while. I would say it took me like a couple chapters to kind of figure out exactly what my process was and and how how I write and kind of where I was going. So I I feel like maybe I bumbled around a little bit and then I was like, "Oh yeah, this is what I want to do and this is where I want to go." But, you know, sometimes I would get stuck a little bit and kind of wonder about things, but it was enjoyable. Like once once I started writing and and figuring out what I wanted to say, it, it's enjoyable. Like I get really into it. Mm, sure. That's really encouraging to hear actually. Cause I think, I know it's something like writing a book, something I've often thought about, but it's often really stayed mm. as a thought because it often just yeah. feels a bit so overwhelming, yeah. doesn't it? To like, yeah. yeah, where, yeah, where to start and like, <laughs> yeah, all those words, etc. So how do you, Amy, find sort of work to find a healthy balance, like with food and exercise in your life? So I am someone who never really struggled. I never struggled with an eating disorder. And so it's been easier for me to balance my eating and my exercise. And I've learned a lot actually in treating people with eating disorders, especially intuitive eating. When I was first introduced to the idea of intuitive eating, when I first started treating eating disorders back in like 2006, it like blew my mind. I was just like so amazed. And so I've just been working on that ever since then, you know, working on my own intuitive eating and working on my own relationship with exercise. And over the years, my, the way I exercise has changed. I think just because, you know, my body is getting older. Like when I was in high school, I was dancing, you know, for hours and hours a day. And, you know, now I, I can't do that. My body doesn't do that. And I just have to recognize what feels good on my body and what doesn't feel good. And if I'm doing it and it's painful that I need to take it easy and stop and, and be a little bit more gentle with my body and, you know, kind of fit it in when I can. And, and I'm also someone who is fine missing exercise. Like I'm not very regimented about it. I do it when I can and I do the things that I want to do. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. So now it sounds like you've got like quite a harmonious kind of balance really. And what I'm interested, Amy, like in the U S as well, do you actually use like intuitive eating principles as part of like treatment for eating disorders? Is that like kind of, a, is it sort of a recognized acknowledged treatment that's used? You know, that's, that's a really interesting question. And I, I had the privilege of working at a residential treatment center called the Center for Change when I first got introduced to eating disorder treatment. And they were probably the first, I need to check my facts on this, but they were probably the first Mm -hmm. or one of the first treatment facilities to use intuitive eating. And still there are a lot of treatment centers that do not use intuitive eating. They're still, you know, doing exchanges and that kind of a thing. And so I was introduced to intuitive eating and started using intuitive eating with my clients before it ever got popular. You know, I think intuitive eating has only gotten popular in the last couple years, 
but the center for change was, was using intuitive eating at their treatment center, you know, back in the early two thousands. So Mm. I don't know that everyone here, I don't know that it's a United States thing. I think it's still, it's still growing. That movement is still growing here as far as eating disorder treatment. Yeah, no, sure. Because I think in the UK as well, I mean, generally, definitely like in the National Health Service, intuitive eating isn't really used as a kind of proper treatment yet. Mm-hmm. You know, it would it's more kind of like cognitive behavior therapy and then, you know, like doing the kind of whole meal planning, regular eating, all of that kind of thing and more, more regimented, I guess. Uh-huh. But yeah, I mean, hopefully it's going to kind of be coming in a bit more because I just sort of think, yeah, there's so much to learn and, and it's so helpful, I think, isn't it, in recovery from an eating disorder and just changing your whole relationship with food through those principles. Yeah, and, and some clients I've had who have used like an exchange-based program for recovery, they get obsessive about the exchanges. You know, it's just another thing that they can focus on or that the eating disorder focuses on and keeps them stuck. Whereas... Yeah that intuitive eating really allows them to let go and relax their relationship with food. Yeah, no, sure. I think it's so true, isn't it? That key thing about kind of letting go. Cause I think it's not unusual sometimes that people do kind of recover in inverted commas, but, and they may be a healthy weight, but they're still completely rule bound and rigid. And, and that's still, it's just like another prison, but maybe just not quite as horrible as the kind of like, previous prison <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. amy can you hear the rain at the moment no <laughs> <laughs> i'm just really hopeful that like, it doesn't sound up on the on the podcast anyway so moving on amy what do you think we can do to support young people growing up to have a better relationship with food and their bodies so i think first things first you have to be a good example you have to be comfortable in your relationship with food. You have to be comfortable in your relationship with your body. And once, once you yourself are comfortable, then you can set that example and pass that on to that younger generation. And so hopefully those children who are watching you and looking to you hear you speaking respectfully about other people's bodies Hopefully they're not hearing you, you know, criticizing bodies or commenting on someone's size because they will pick up on that. And I've had clients in my office who, you know, of course their parents are, are well-meaning, but sometimes just one errant comment from a father or a mother sticks with them. And they're like, I just knew that my dad would make fun of women in larger bodies, you know, or whatever it is. And, and it mm. sticks with them. And so we have to be really careful how we talk about other people's bodies. Mm. And then I think we also need to allow children to set their own terms with their bodies. I see a lot of parents who want to control their children's weight and control their children's eating. And I understand that it's coming from a good place. I think that they're trying to be responsible parents and trying to teach their children healthy habits, if you will, healthy in quotes. But we need to understand that it's, it's their body. They get to be in charge of their own body. And even as a parent, you can't control that child's body. I think the other, the other thing is to avoid those power struggles around food, the power struggles around exercise. It just never really works out. Like anytime, oh, sorry, my cat is oh, <laughs> joining in. <laughs> Hopefully the cat you can hear the cat. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, going back to power struggles, I, I just never see that turning out well. You know, if parents are like trying to control the food or trying to make their child exercise, it really harms that relationship and kind of, you know, sets the stage, I think, for worse problems down the road. Mm. The other thing I would say is, is it's okay to talk about bodies. You know, children will have questions. They'll talk about other people's bodies. They'll talk about their shape and size and color. I know sometimes my kids will say, well, this person is fat, you know, and they'll, they'll try out the word fat. And I'll say something like, is it okay to be fat? Does it make them a bad person if they're fat? 
And we'll talk about how good people come in all shapes and sizes, and that's okay. And I think it's good for them to hear that, especially because sometimes at school, they're getting those different messages from teachers and students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's so true, isn't it? I think it's just, it's really helpful to kind of have some of those open conversations. Because I think as well, sometimes as a parent, you can feel a bit scared of having those conversations or you're, you're like, you're worried about saying the wrong thing or kind of mm. that's putting, I don't know, unhelpful ideas in your child's head or something. When actually it's, it's so good to have those kind of open conversations and get kids to just kind of question and think things through. Yeah, I agree with that, that, you know, sometimes we're afraid of those conversations because we think if we'll say something wrong. And like you said, just having the conversation, it's, it's the act of having the conversation that makes it better. It, it's not always that you, you know, say exactly the perfect right thing mm-hmm. all the time, but it's just the act of having that conversation will help it get better. Yeah, no, so true. So really good points there, Amy. So three final quick fire questions for you. So what would be like your last supper meal? (laughs) (laughs) My last supper meal. I love my mom's chicken and dumpling stew. And like, if I go home, she'll, she'll ask me sometimes, is there something you want me to make? And it's always that one, your chicken and dumpling stew. And then my favorite, favorite dessert is brownie sundae. Those are my favorite foods. <laughs> mm, oh, lovely. And do you have a favorite quote or mantra? I love the saying bloom where you're planted. I don't know who originally said that, but it's all over the place. And I just feel like no matter where you are, you can make things beautiful around you like it doesn't have to be like amazing or sometimes it's not ideal but you can do something good where you're at right now in this moment Mm, sure and that's a really empowering quote I really love that and tell us something about you that may surprise us well maybe it's not a surprise now that you heard my cat (laughs) meowing but I'm a cat lady (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm not uh, a weird cat lady. I don't have like tons of cats roaming around my house and reproducing and, and that kind of thing. I have one cat, but I do love my cat. Like she's just a really fun addition, I think, to our family. Oh, lovely. <laughs> so Amy, where can people find you if they want to know more about you? So I have a website. It's www.reflectwholenesstherapy.com. I'm also on Instagram. You can find me at Amy Harmon LMFT there. And then you can find my book on Amazon or any other places that you get your books like Barnes and Noble or, or other online sources. Sure. And Amy, what's the name of your book? It's called Perfectly Imperfect, Compassionate Strategies for, <laughs> and now I'm going blank, Compassionate Strategies <laughs> for Improving Your, for more positive body image sure okay no brilliant so i just wondering if anyone like was gonna have a quick like search on amazon uh, yeah brilliant but I'll, I'll link all that in the show notes anyway so people can go and like oh, um awesome. yeah find out more okay brilliant well amy thank you so much for coming on the podcast and for talking today and um, i think you know loads of really great info i think for people to listen to here and take away and um, so i really appreciate it thank you yeah thank you for having me this is fun So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode just as much as I did. So do go and check out Amy's details in the show notes. So if you're not following me already, do seek me out on Instagram at The Eating Disorder Therapist. And if you would like to receive weekly articles to your inbox, do sign up on my homepage at rethinkyourbody.co.uk. Thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon. (music) 